should this railway have closed? Favoured by commuters, was it right that, with a now rapidly rising population, this town should have been severed from the rail network? Would the railway that once served it be used today? Or would it have been a high-maintenance relic from a bygone era? Or would the continued presence of the line have seen the fields and countryside hereabouts become part of an ever-encroaching urban sprawl? Much of this railway is left to be discovered since its closure. From bridges, to buildings, to hidden huts, to secret cuttings, and the memory of the route's lost stations. And so much is preserved on film, whether amateur or professional. So in exploring what remains of this line, perhaps we may find the answers to our questions. Let us rediscover the Buntingford branch line, or the Bunt, Hertfordshire's finest lost railway. Located on the Hartford East branch of the West Anglia Main Line, 20 miles and 25 chains from London Liverpool Street, St Margaret's Railway Station was once a junction for services along the now closed railway to Buntingford. A little under 14 miles in length, the branch opened in 1863, operating for just over a century when it was closed to passengers in November 1964. Passing through the delightful East Hertfordshire countryside and shadowing the river's ash and rib for much of its journey to Buntingford, this film explores what remains and what there is to rediscover of this lost line. We start at St Margaret's and, bar some cosmetic changes, there is little difference to the station facade in the 80 years that has elapsed between these two shots. Facing west, the catenary wires obscure the view of this fine-looking station. But at platform level, the disused signal box which once controlled the comings and goings of the Buntingford branch remains in situ. And with our backs to the signal box, we see the bay platform from which trains along the branch came and went. Today, the same bay platform has had its track lifted and has been out of use for many years. Facing east, we see the signal box to the right and the bay platform on our left, in this picture from 1959. What a difference six decades makes, as we take in the same view today. With the signal to proceed, trains would depart west. As can be seen in this footage. Curving off the main line at this point. And here, the same curve today, where a footpath now occupies the trackbed. The first of a number of river crossings now, and this one across the River Lee navigation, where the railway bridge has been replaced with a footbridge. But here it was back in about 1920, with the service bound for St Margaret's. Indeed, the remnants of one of the following bridges lies discarded in the undergrowth, as we proceed along the line's northeasterly course. Our footage takes us across the Lee navigation. And beneath Holly Cross Road Bridge. Which continues to carry cars across this railway cutting. Peppering the track bed at this point, a number of hallowed monuments remain embedded in the earth. Here, trains made their first crossing of the River Ash on Bridge 2049. The shallow, tree-lined cutting makes for a pleasantly framed scene. And by the trackside, sleepers are still to be found, alongside the foundations of what might have been a plate layer's hut. And here too, a conduit for, presumably, signalling. We cross the ash once again, and we can trace the railway's onward course through this picturesque valley. Back down to earth, the railway near Waters Place Farm is now a track on what is a serene and beautiful part of the line. And here it is in the years before closure. Bridge 2053 frames the way ahead. Here it is seen from the front of a DMU as we arrive at our first point of call. Cool. 
Comprising a single platform and equipped with a small signal box which oversaw the entrance to a siding, Mardok served the small community of Westside, some half a mile hence. The signal box now resides in a nearby private garden, but the station buildings seen here in this closer study were not so fortunate. Today, there is nothing left to see during the summer months. But in winter, the undergrowth beats a retreat and the station emerges. Otherwise, only the station master's house remains in this peaceful, secluded setting. We bid Mardok farewell. And stand here on bridge 2054, taking in the railway's straight alignment. Just over a quarter of a mile later, trains pass through the railway's deepest cutting. And then beneath the now demolished and infilled bridge 2055, carrying the B1004. Seen here in better days, heralding our arrival at the next station. Situated just over a mile from Mardock and under four miles from St Margaret's was Woodford. Like Mardock, a single platform served Woodford's needs throughout its life. In addition to the array of platform buildings, a signal box controlled entry to the siding with its goods and cattle dock. From the same position today, facing Buntingford, it is as if the station was never here. We face back towards Mardock and see the signal box and a portion of bridge 2055 in the distance. All gone now, all gone. We depart to Whitford. And today the railway's course is plotted by some mighty trees. And here the river ash once more. But if we prune the bracken, branches and foliage and peer into the past, we see Crackney Bridge and an N7 locomotive passing through this pastoral scene. And here is the bridge today. Let's take a closer look. The timbers on the bridge are understandably in a poor condition. Whereas the ironwork seems ready to bear the passage of trains once more. At one end is written Woodford. And at the other, Haddam, so that those constructing the bridge were sure to fit this span correctly. For some distance now, the track bed is extensively overgrown. But what have we here? In this cutting, a plate layer's hut stands forlorn and forgotten. Within, two hallowed monuments are to be found. Looking towards Haddam, the onward course is enmeshed with nettles and the blight of graffiti has visited even this obscure place. Let us continue. And breaking free from the undergrowth, take in the railway's course from above. ground level once more we find Black Bridge, number 2057. Upon crossing Black Bridge, the railway took a sweeping northwesterly curve, ascending the gradient, where, today, crops and wild grasses grow. But it was here that trains entered the next station. With two platforms, a signal box, goods yard, crossover, and at one time a footbridge, Haddam was easily the most substantial station on the branch since departure from St Margaret's. The principal station buildings were on the up platform, with a waiting room on the down line. The same view today. 
The station buildings lingered on for some time until demolition, after being vandalised for a number of years. But could this be a post from the crossing gate, slumbering in the undergrowth? We depart northeast. And in this view from Kettle Green Road Bridge, we see Haddam Station in the background, with this N7 locomotive hauling the 232 St Margaret's to Buntingford service on the 10th of March 1956. On the bridge today, both the train and the shallow cutting through which it passed are gone. But the bridge is seen here on its north side, with a DMU passing beneath it. The line reached the summit some 320 feet above sea level. This plate layer's hut can still be found on the margins of Bartram's Wood, in what must have been a remote outpost for the railway. No doubt the railway's workers were glad of shelter on inclement days. Or appreciative of the view in the summer months. With Bartram's Wood in the middle distance, trains continued northeast. Where on the ground the alignment is perfectly framed. And from the sky we bear witness to its onward course. Leaving the countryside behind, Trains passed over Paper Mill Lane crossing. And over bridge 2061, under which the River Rib flows. The latter remains, but gone is the bridge which carried trains here from right to left. Approaching the station now, trains would slow. As we see here in this cinefilm footage. Thus it was trains called at Standen. Located on the north side of the A120 level crossing, the station comprised of a single platform on the downline and was similar to both Mardock and Woodford in its construction. The station yard featured a number of sidings, as can be seen in this excellent picture, and to the bottom right, one can see the private siding which belonged to the adjacent Standen flour mill. Here, our archive footage affords us a closer view of the station and the arrival of a DMU. Platform buildings dated from 1869, after the original structures were destroyed by fire. And it was these replacements that served the railway until its closure. Nothing remains today. The station site has been overbuilt by housing, and the traffic on the A120 has become louder and busier. Upon departure from Standen, the railway re-entered the countryside and passed through a shallow cutting close to the River Rib. And after a mile, trains would pass beneath Bridge 2062. So entering Braffing. Seen here from the road over bridge, it is clear that, like Haddam, this was one of the branch's more substantial stations. There was once a covered footbridge and a large goods yard protected by the signal box seen at the end of the down platform. Happily, today much has been done to restore the station's character and spirit. And from the road there is still much of this country station to admire. We stand on the platform, which last saw passenger services in November 1964. In 1954, the station featured in the British independent comedy film Happily Ever After, directed by Mario Zampi. 
Released in America as Tonight's the Night, it starred David Niven, Yvonne De Carlo, and Barry Fitzgerald. Set in Ireland, the station was renamed Rathbarney and features in a number of the film's sequences. We wait him splendid. God rest his soul. Big boy now. Can I help it if he's still interested in me? He's not going to be. Not while I'm here to stop him. No, we shall all quickly learn to like and respect. My good friends. Five years later, another British comedy film called Operation Bullshine also used the station. The film starred Donald Sinden, Barbara Murray, and Carol Leslie. Though not original, the only rails on the branch to be found here as we leave this delightful station behind. And we continue north. Trees now grow where rails once lay. And here's a gate which will take us to the track bed. Let's have a look. Not an awful lot to see at this point. But on the margins of the track bed, an uprooted tree has taken what looks like to be a fence post with it. And in the water, this could be part of a gate which once guarded the line. For the next mile, the railway's course is now on private land, but the archive footage once again presents us with what once was. From tree-lined avenues, the railway entered farmland and passed through this cutting and beneath the Hay Street Lane Bridge, number 2065. Both are gone now, but the cutting have been filled in and the bridge demolished. Trains passed beneath the A10 on the skew and continued north. Just under a mile since passing beneath Hay Street Bridge, trains would enter the line's penultimate station. Resembling Mardock in particular, West Mill comprised a single platform on the down line, running parallel with a good siding. On the south side of the crossing there was even a signal box, but this was dismantled and replaced by a ground frame. Nearly six decades since closure, nothing of this neat rural station remains. So let us see what once was. We stand with our back to West Mill, facing south, so that we might compare the view with this footage. West Mill featured in the 1962 Spike Milligan comedy Postman's Knock, directed by Robert Lynn. In the film, Milligan plays a much-loved village postman whose promotion sees him transfer to London, where high japes ensue. In these scenes, the villagers bid him farewell, as we see the station then and now. Now. 
Having left West Mill, we find, a quarter of a mile later, the hump in the road which was another crossing. But turning back the clock, this photograph from over a century ago presents what was a crossing keeper's cottage at this location. Sadly, like so much else, no trace of it is to be found today. Let us go back into the past now, to travel forward through the final mile of cuttings and embankments. We leave behind the countryside for the final time, where the bushes and trees which mark the railway's journey into Buntingford are replaced a few hundred metres later by tarmac and brick. But it was here that trains made their approach into the final station. Built as a through station, the original plan to continue to Cambridge being thwarted, Buntingford was easily the most substantial station on the branch. The station house here was flanked by a large goods shed, but about the station site there was a huge goods yard, coal storage bays, coal office, loading docks, signal box, and sundry other buildings and features besides. The single platform was 416 feet in length, with a runaround loop and track for sidings and shunting, making this the largest track layout of any station on the line. Where once there was this extensive yard, there is now housing. But what of the main station building seen here? It yet survives and has been transformed into a characterful private residence. Whilst there is so much that is unique to this railway, the story of its closure is a regrettably familiar one. The rise of the motor car saw to it that by the middle of the 20th century, passenger numbers were in diminution. Those commuting by train preferred to catch more direct services to the capital from other local stations, and daytime trains saw only a scattering of passengers. Dr Beeching recommended the line's closure in his report of 1963, and so it was that passenger services were withdrawn, with the final service occurring on the 14th of November 1964. Freight continued to serve Buntingford, Haddam and Stanham until September 1965. Shortly thereafter, the track was lifted and the line closed for good. Few will mourn the closure of a road, but railways, their structures, their sounds, their stories have always felt part of the landscape. Nature's reclamation of the railway has been rapid in some areas, tamed in others, or facilitated by necessity. But whatever the case, the memory of this railway is well within touching distance, if one knows where to look. I hope you enjoyed this film. And don't forget to like, leave a comment and subscribe. Do share the film widely and follow Rediscovering Lost Railways.